damn it, this is not a good news story. This is a people are dying story. This is a life or death story. A cry for help, aid delayed, and people suffering in Puerto Rico's post-storm crisis. I'm shocked that some would politicize such a sensitive, desperate situation. South Florida Congressman Carlos Curbelo presses for aid, not politics. He is with us live this morning. We're gonna do everything we can to help Puerto Rico. Fallout in Florida. The governor promises help and plans for an influx of Puerto Ricans. These were attacks on American diplomats. These were people working at the embassy. They were specifically targeted. Sonic attack reaction. The U.S. cuts embassy staff in Havana and tells Americans it's not safe to travel to Cuba. A full play today. Good morning. Great to be with you today. We begin with the politics of crisis. Day number 11 since Hurricane Maria decimated Puerto Rico. It's three and a half million U.S. citizens living a growing humanitarian crisis. The president gives himself high marks for the federal response so far, but plenty of others on both sides of the aisle say it was late coming and not the kind of full-throated response that Mr. Trump provided after Harvey hit Texas and Irma tore up Florida. South Florida Congressman Carlos Curbelo represents the Florida Keys, one of the areas hit hardest by Irma. And this week he called for tax relief for victims of both hurricanes Irma and Maria. Good morning. Thank you for being here. You have had Thank a busy schedule yeah. this I week. I think the whole Everywhere. country has had yes, a busy have. last few weeks. It's yeah. been tough. We, we have indeed. All right, if we can, we'll get to the Keys in a minute. First, the president's response to uh, what happened, the crisis in Puerto Rico. Too little, too late, uh, not responsive enough. What do you think? A couple things. Number one, there isn't enough we can do for Puerto Rico. The situation there is dire. We're going to approve a new aid package, about $7 billion worth of funding next week. Uh, no water, uh, no uh, power. It is just a very difficult situation. So. Uh, again, there isn't enough we can do. We have to do more and we will have to continue doing more for a long time. I think the aid might have been a little late in getting to Puerto Rico. The big challenge now, I keep hearing reports from the ground there, there's a lot of aid at the airport, at the getting seaport, that out to the people. but the distribution is a problem. And, and Michael Glenn, I think this is an important point. When these disasters strike, it requires a whole of government response. Communities cannot just sit back and wait for the federal government to come. There has to be coordination. We saw that in Florida. Thankfully in Florida, the response was well coordinated. I think in Texas, people feel the same way. Regrettably, Puerto Rico is a small island, far from the mainland. They already had many challenges with regards to infrastructure, finances before the storm, and now we're seeing a lot of the island's internal politics play out. There's a strike, which is unconscionable in my opinion, truck drivers striking uh, in the middle of this crisis. So I think there's plenty of criticism to go around. I hope that the focus in the coming weeks is to help people and not to get on television or to argue who is uh, who's succeeding and who's failing. You know, well, let's talk about that because at the top of this program, we aired a uh, clip of what you said on the floor of Congress this week. You were shocked at people politicizing this situation. Were, are you really shocked? Because a lot of crises that have <coughs> gone on in our lives in the past year have politicians coming out, stepping up. And I guess the corollary to that question, Congressman, is if the politicians and elected leaders do not come forward and do not have a, a visible presence, well, then there's criticism. Where are they? So maybe I'm still a little uh, too new to this, but I would have hoped that when it comes to hurricane aid, to helping people who are desperate, <laughs> whose lives have been devastated, uh, we could put politics aside. We actually did in the House uh, at the end of the day on Thursday. Uh, because we passed with a strong bipartisan vote, a tax relief package, where I was an original uh, co-sponsor and led the debate uh, on the floor. Uh, but some of my colleagues were saying, well, this isn't enough. We need to do more. And my question to them was, look, it's a first step. It's something that will help people recover. Should I go back home and tell uh, my constituents that someone from New York said this we were doing for them isn't enough, so they should get nothing? Yeah. And that's the problem with, with Congress. It's, it's usually 
all or nothing, and that's what has to change. Yeah. So we did come together finally, and, uh, and we especially need to come together when it comes to Puerto Rico because the situation yeah. is so dire. There. We Floridians are going to have to come together because I can assure you, Within weeks, uh, we are likely to see a major influx of Puerto Ricans, yeah. and we will welcome them. They're U.S. citizens. They're welcome to go anywhere they right. want in our country, but we have to be prepared. And, and we'll get to that influx in just a minute. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but the storm hit Puerto Rico on Wednesday, September 20th. Almost immediately, the president said the right thing. I'm declaring an emergency disaster. Relief should be going in. Then on that Thursday, he goes to his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, tweets for the next four days about the NFL, doesn't really have a meeting about Puerto Rico, and then is kind of surprised when people in Puerto Rico, like the mayor of San Juan, says, we're dying down here. We need your help. Yeah, it's unfortunate, and oftentimes this president lacks focus, doesn't realize that the most important thing a president can do is unite the country behind an important worthwhile cause, in this case, saving the lives of American citizens in Puerto Rico and throughout the country. Uh, and by the way, presidents have to understand that optics are important. I remember, I think there was a time where there was a, a national tragedy, someone was killed or some terrorist event, and President Obama gave a, a speech and then went to play golf. He was criticized for that, too. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. When you are in a position of leadership, you have to worry not just about uh, whether uh, the right thing is happening, whether logistics are in place, but the message that you are sending, in this case, yeah. uh, the top political official in the country. So, yeah, yes, I, the I, president, I, I hope... Uh, will learn to change that. Yeah. I'm not uh, willing to bet. Yeah, on it. I, I, I re remember, and this is true of all presidents. George W. Bush, after a shooting of some kind, an awful tragedy, spoke to reporters on a golf course, and as soon as he finished speaking, he said, "And now watch this drive." That's right. I mean, that, that, that that was another unfortunate optic. You know, I when you talk about Puerto Rico, the news is about Puerto Rico. The U.S. citizens living in the U.S. Virgin Islands are are they getting enough attention congressman is the aid getting i know the tax package that congress that the house passed this week that you sponsored involves everybody in the wake of that storm from uh, puerto rico to the u.s virgin islands why aren't we seeing more attention diverted there well clearly the structural damage in u.s virgin islands is not as extensive as it is in puerto rico but like the Florida Keys, U.S. Virgin Islands is a tourism economy, yeah. and now they haven't yeah. had tourists for about a month. So it is a dire situation there. I work very closely with Stacey Plaskett, who is the delegate for the Virgin Islands uh, in the Congress. And by the way, all of these packages, whether it's the tax relief package that we got passed on Thursday, the FEMA aid package we're going to get passed next week, they apply to everyone equally. So that means Texas, Louisiana, Florida, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. All right, if we can, let's turn to your district, the 26th Congressional District, which goes from South Miami-Dade all the way down to the Keys. Obviously, Marathon South was the most heavily destroyed hit uh, area from Irma, and you have spent a lot of time down there. Give us a status report. How are they doing? So things are getting better. Uh, obviously, uh, those uh, whose homes were destroyed uh, are in bad shape. They're looking for temporary housing. We're f starting to see some of the, we call them trailers. FEMA asks us to call them mobile housing units. So I'll call them mobile housing units to appease them <laughs> since they're trying to help our community. Uh, so those are coming in and things are stabilizing the Florida Keys. I saw a lot of debris cleanup yesterday. Uh, so that's good news. You, but were on, you were on Big Pine. I Key. went to Big Pine, which yeah. I think uh, made out the worst out of all of the, out of mm. all of the Keys. That was on the, the dirty side of the eye that came right. across. Right, the, the northern eye yeah. wall. That's right. Uh, but what I'm really worried about is long term, the economy in the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tourism economy. Uh, there's an article in today's Miami Herald about the affordable housing crisis that already existed before the storm. A lot of these laborers, these workers, right. restaurant workers, hotel workers, if they haven't left, they're probably going to. These people can't be out of work for three weeks, for a month. So how do we get people back to uh, fill all these positions? How do we get these hotels, these restaurants open again? Without them, right. there's no Florida Keys. You know, we had on this program last weekend, we had Monroe County's Administrator Roman Gestesi and the workforce housing, the affordable housing, 
was a huge issue to him as well. And to your point, there are these, what do you call them, mobile home? Mobile housing mobile units, housing please. Mobile housing units, <laughs> which, which is a great stopgap on the road to recovery. But in long term, housing in the Keys was pretty unaffordable to a lot of people to begin with. That's right. And as terrible as these, as these storms are, they do give communities an opportunity to start from the beginning. Yeah. And perhaps some of these um, trailer parks that existed in the Keys that were devastated, maybe those uh, uh, land, those parcels can be converted into sound Cat 4, Cat yeah. 5 proof affordable housing that will allow people to live in the Florida Keys. Because as yeah. it is, uh, you know, before the storm, there's a bus that takes people down from Miami-Dade County, from the, a lot of these people live in the Homestead area, right. South yeah. Dade, right. to the Florida Keys, because it's impossible for, for people to find housing. All right, yeah. very quickly, if I can, uh, hundreds of people in the Keys uh, who lost their homes or their homes were unlivable uh, received individual assistance from FEMA. You helped arrange a lot of that. I know Senator Rubio, mm -hmm. Senator Nelson, there's been a nice kind of bipartisan effort in that regard, but that, that under that support, that financial support, paying the hotel bills, that's going to run out. What are those people going to do? So that's why this tax relief package was so important. And again, it's a first step. I hope we can do more. Uh, but for next year, these people are going to see a lot of relief in their tax bills. So typically, if you have a property or a casualty loss that is less than 10% of your income, you cannot deduct that from your taxes. We have waived that for uh, really all of South Florida, a lot of counties in the state of Florida, not just the Florida Keys. Uh, for employers, uh, we approved a $6,000 per employee wage tax credit. So employers will get reimbursed up to $6,000 per employee if they keep people employed in this core disaster area. Uh, people who have 401k plans through their employers or their own IRA plans, they will be able to access those funds without penalty. So what we tried to do was open up uh, the tax code to give all these people relief. And for lower and middle income families, the earned income tax credit, which is yeah. critical for them, there are almost 500,000 beneficiaries in Miami-Dade County, almost 10,000 in the Keys, they will be able to refer back to last year's wages in order to qualify for the earned income tax credit. So yeah. these are all things that will help. They will not bring people's lives back to normal. We do have yeah. to accept that months. when one of these storms passes, yeah. and, and we remember Andrew here, it, we, it takes time and it's tough yeah. and, and the government can help, but it can't solve every single problem. We need to take a quick break. We will talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back live in our studio this morning, Congressman Carlos Curbelo. We have talked about uh, Puerto Rico and the Keys. Let's talk now, if we can, Congressman, about Cuba, a major announcement. You saw it coming, I think. Uh, on Friday, the State Department announced that it's going to withdraw 60 percent of its diplomats and their families from Cuba. They're going to stop issuing visas, and they've warned United States citizens don't travel to Cuba. It's dangerous. Michael, these attacks, uh, I'm shocked that it has not become a bigger international story because to, to modify people's health using apparently sonic waves to cause brain damage to people who are sleeping on a bed using sonic waves. We don't know if the Cuban government uh, did this themselves, but uh, we all know that the host government is always responsible for guaranteeing right. the safety and security of all diplomatic personnel. Even with countries where relations aren't as good, that is a, an international standard. So. In my opinion, the response for now is insufficient. I think this is a logical first step. We want to keep people safe. And for those Americans who want to come home because they're fearful of serving in Cuba, they should be allowed to. But I think that as many people as we withdraw, we should expel the same number of Cuban diplomats because they should not be able to have a diplomatic advantage as a result of this situation. So and from Washington at the Cuban embassy, a light number of their yeah, diplomats. Yeah, they've only expelled two people. Yeah. And, uh, and after they expelled those two people, this continued. So uh, I, I think uh, a lot more needs to be done to hold uh, the Cuban dictatorship accountable. I will say that uh, this canceling of the visa program, I don't think is a smart idea. I think it should continue. Obviously, we won't have the capacity to process as many visas, but let's focus on keeping out 
Mariela Castro and all of these uh, Cuban government officials who have right. come to the United States and paraded around here, sure, let's keep them out. But people who are just trying to come and visit uh, their family, I don't think we should uh, freeze those visas. Well, for the official record, the Cuban government has denied any sort of involvement in the actual attacks. To your point, uh, I don't think we've heard the steps that they may have taken or not to prevent them or investigate them. But there have been pretty high-level talks between Cuban government and U.S. government officials behind the scenes on this very topic. How much of the political back and forth might get in the way, Congressman, of really getting to the truth of what's going on? Well, I think some in uh, the State Department here in our country are deeply invested in the previous administration's policy of engagement and they're trying to protect that. And I understand that ideologically they think uh, that's important, but I hope they would take into account the unprecedented and just vile nature of what has happened. And again, let's assume the Cubans uh, were not at all involved. Cuba is a closed society. The Cuban government has a spy on every block. Yeah. I would be hard pressed to believe that they had no idea that this was happening. It, maybe it was an experiment gone wrong. Maybe they were just trying to listen to conversations. Uh, I mean, they've done terrible things in the past. They, you know, the stories. They've uh, urinated in the homes, yeah. of, uh, in the kitchens yeah. of uh, U.S. diplomats. This is far worse than anything they've done in the past, and, and there has to be some yeah. accountability. Uh, Congressman, uh, obviously, uh, since uh, the opening that President Obama made a couple of years ago, yes. airlines, cruise lines, tour organizers, uh, hotel management companies, untold millions and millions and millions of dollars has been invested to encourage Americans, even though they can't be tourists, I mean, have gone to Cuba. All of that is at jeopardy now. I think it is. And by the way, I think that's all the Cubans really wanted from this. They wanted a little cash. They wanted to see more right. American tourists. I don't think they ever had any intentions of truly establishing close, warm ties with the United States, much less of yeah, changing they wanted their our style dollars. of government. They have our dollars now. Uh, that is certainly at risk. And if I was an American who wasn't as attached to this Cuba tragedy and I heard of these uh, health attacks, I'd probably be a little concerned about traveling to Cuba myself. Yeah. On that note, we thank you for being with us this morning. I know you have a lot to do uh, in your district. It's good to be here always. Hurricane We're relief. Glad to eat. Just want to say before you leave, we know the Democrats have a target on your back and you seem to be eluding it so far, but come back and we'll talk. I, I wear it comfortably. <laughs> All right, Congressman <laughs> thank Carlos you, Carbello, thanks thank very Great much. To see you. We appreciate it. All right, up next, yes, it is time for the Powerhouse Roundtable. Well, so much happened this week all over the world and in our little world that deserves analysis and comment. We've got it for you. You know what that means. Time for the roundtable. Let's set the plate, though, with a look at the weekend blitz of tweets the president launched targeting the mayor of San Juan. Such poor leadership ability, not able to get their workers to help. They want everything done for them when it should be a community effort. 10,000 federal workers now on the island doing a fantastic job. So we start there with our panel today. Marlon Hill is an attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Berthesel firm and a past president of the Caribbean Bar Association. Patricia Meze covers politics for the Miami Herald. She is just back from days in Puerto Rico writing about the dire situation there. Rene Pedrosa is a veteran South Florida journalist. He works for America TV. How was that? That was actually America pretty good. TV. <laughs> that <was> Welcome. Actually, <laughs> that was actually pretty Renee, good. Patty. Hello, everyone. Thank Marlon, you. Great Thank to you. have you come in. Thank you. Uh, Patty, uh, if we can start with you, because you alone among us here uh, were on the ground in Puerto Rico. Give us your kind of a, a reporter's notebook. Tell us about what it was like to be there immediately after the storm, what you saw, what you felt. It, I don't think I realized until I came back that people didn't realize how awful the situation was there because to us it was just the extent of the devastation that was so remarkable. It was not a flattened island, you know, the buildings were still up, things like that, but everywhere we went, every town we were asked if we were FEMA, we were the first people that they saw who were not uh, 
people who lived in their town and so they wanted help and and all we could say is we're going to tell your story to the world and and get the word out there uh, but we you know in the days we were there which was during the storm right after the storm we did not see a massive operation to help these people and i think since then the aid has been arriving uh, the people have been arriving the the people to help but it's still the distribution problem and it's still not getting to some of the hardest hit places and this is a whole island that's devastated so this is months and months of work ahead of us. You know what we've been seeing is a lot of reporters are getting to places inaccessible in Puerto Rico before any of the help Right, it keeps there. going and yeah. they keep asking them of their FEMA and they keep asking them for help and then when you say you can't help then they offer you water which is you know wild people still trying to help each other in those situations that are getting increasingly desperate. Yeah, you know Marlon last week um, prior to the Puerto Rico attention last week I think it was you who mentioned in the past couple of weeks, maybe in a conversation, how amazing it was that the Caribbean hit by Maria first, sort of waiting for help, but helping themselves first. And, and that it resonates this week after the tweets that the, the president sent out, almost accusing Puerto Rico of not helping itself. What do you, mm -hmm. what do you see there? Well, you know, since we're in the Caribbean, you know, there's a Jamaican word by the name of brotopsy. Meaning that brought up see. The president <laughs> is just lacking a little bit of dignity and decency in, in, in the middle of a natural disaster. It's not the way to treat people um, when we're trying to get through the, the hardest of times. Um, you know, the Caribbean, they have, they have the CARICOM grouping, right, which is the grouping of the English-speaking mm -hmm. Caribbean um, governments and, the, um, and Haiti as well. They started mobilizing from Barbados and St. Lucia moving items because there are ferries that go between the islands, right? You know, so the devastation in the U.S. Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands is just as bad in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico, right? Yeah. Which is really why we need leadership in terms of some sort of international multilateral coalition to help not only Puerto Rico, but the rest of the countries um, being devastated. Yeah. Tourism is devastated. The marine industry is devastated. So the res resources for the economies of these islands are going to be in dire, dire needs of for a long of time to come. Yeah. Uh, uh, Renee, um, I, I think that this back and forth that we have seen over the last few days between Mayor Carmen Yulan Cruz, uh, Mayor of San Juan, uh, who was just on George Stephanopoulos this morning, struck me as sincere and and really begging for help, and the criticism of her from President Trump. Um, go through this. I mean, why are they at odds? Because she criticized the response, and now he personalized it and took out after her. I, I, I'm going to follow up on what Marlon said. I think that President Trump has a problem that he cannot accept criticism and move on. You know, he brings a bazooka to a knife fight, um, and I wasn't in Puerto Rico, so maybe Patty can answer this, but the mayor of Puerto Rico is waist deep every day in sewer water. She, you see her with a blowhorn going house that, to that's house. That's literal. We have seen that's, that video. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is on an everyday basis. Um, it is not fair that this is going to turn into something political, a war of, of, of tweets. Um, it, it's not fair. I think that her cries are... Honest, I agree with you, Mike. I think that I agree with her that the situation is very, very dangerous. Um, thousands of people are going to start coming here. Uh, yeah. a, a carnival boat, I believe, is coming on, on Tuesday. Uh, the airport at Miami International mm -hmm. Airport, we had 18 flights with like 3,000 Puerto Ricans that are going to start coming over. So I think that this is not the time to be playing a tweet war uh, on something that is so yeah. delicate. And yeah. desperate. And I, and uh, that's I, the word. Yeah, it, it, that's the word. It, it, it is desperate. Um, you I mean, know, just to add really quick, both Elaine Duke and the general that's in Puerto Rico both have said that there's not enough uh, being done at this point. That the general said more. it's the worst he's ever yes. seen. Right? He told PBS devastating that is the word right. he used. And, and Elaine Duke was the one who said this is a good news story. <clears throat> so I think to your point, what's actually being done and, and the assist that's going over is different from the sort of advertising and marketing that the president likes to do in his Twitter. But in the Twitter feed says, you know, we're doing a great job. This is a fantastic response. He wants people to frame this as a credit to us kind of thing. He's in the bubble. He's in the yeah. bubble, Glenna. So Wh maybe when he goes there to say. Which is from the actual relief that is really being sent. Only 5% mm. of Puerto Ricans have power. So yeah. 
How many people are following a Twitter war between the president and the mayor of San Juan? I mean, this point. is about stateside? basic needs a lot. That's being a, that's a, met. Stateside is a different issue, and I don't think they will forget politically if they come to the mainland that's and they start point. voting in presidential elections. Like, I, I don't disagree, but, you know, it's like the perspective is a little bit jarring to, to yeah. think, like, people trying to find water and a Twitter war. You know, FEMA gave out some numbers yesterday, which I wrote down really quick. 843 rescues, 45% portable water, 5% electricity in the whole island. And that hasn't changed as of and today. That, exactly. 33% in the telecommunications and only 11% of the cell phone towers are, are working. Is there a question to be asked about why an island in a hurricane alley does not have a, a hardened a better infrastructure? electrical it's system? A a it's a big ocean. It's a big ocean. It's a really <laughs> big ocean. Um, you know, the, the politics of being a state, when you're a family, right, and your kids are at home and you have some kids at college, you don't get it to choose how you treat your kids. You know, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands deserve the same sense of urgency as any other state like Texas, Louisiana, and yeah. Florida. You know, I, I, I have to say that in his remarks, first when the president was asked about this dire situation, I think last Monday or so, he said, oh, I know Puerto Ricans. I'm from New York. I grew up. I know Puerto Ricans. He never said in any of that, and I know they are U.S. citizens. And they are free to, and they deserve our, the same help as the people in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, after we had our hurricanes. Um, I, I think he was almost had a approaching a brownie, you're doing a heck of a job uh, moment this week by praising uh, the response before the response was really there. Well, and the point that like Senator Marco Rubio has been making is, this is not a disaster that you can treat like the other disasters where right. FEMA waits for the state and local governments to right. ask for help and once they have a list of needs they come in and help provide some of these needs. The government of Puerto Rico was not in a position to really assess their needs for a long time. They couldn't communicate with people, they couldn't get around and so if if that is the normal procedure, uh, the normal procedure doesn't work. Normal procedure aka the red tape that the mayor of San Juan had mentioned, possibly that bureaucracy. A uh, quick break, and we will be back in two minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back live in our studio this morning. Three of our ace guests are here for the roundtable. Marlon Hill, Patty Mazzei, Renee Pedrosa. Um, Renee, 100,000 Puerto Ricans roughly live in South Florida. Altogether, a million, they mainly live, most Puerto Ricans in Florida live up near Orlando, Osceola County. Uh, there is going to be a huge exodus from the island, will there not? It's gonna be a huge. I mean, I just named last week over 3,000 landed at Miami International a, Airport A lot alone. of them were tourists on that flight. And they were yeah. actually in, in transit, yes. uh, going to, to other cities. Uh, listen, uh, both uh, the Governor Rick Scott says they're ready. Um, the school district, especially, uh, Carvalho says that they're ready. I mean, it is a 350,000 student uh, district. Um, how much can they be ready? They're, he's depending a lot, and so is Rick Scott, that the government, that the federal government is going to step up with a whole lot of money to try to accommodate uh, right. that influx. Well, we have, we have the whole range of government services and housing, employment. I know, Patty, that I, I think <clears throat> I read that uh, 12 legislators have written to the governor and said, set up these processing centers for Puerto Ricans, the sort of one-stop shop to get the aid they need. Yes, and they actually are eligible for more health care on the mainland than they are in the island, for example. Mm. And so while I was in Puerto Rico, I heard of families starting to discuss, because this was early on, perhaps we can get our elderly parents, grandparents, into the mainland. Perhaps we can get our kids into the mainland while we deal with what could be six months without power, what could be weeks without running water. At least protect the more vulnerable populations by sending them to places where they might be able to go to school, might be able to get medical care, mm -hmm. and we can focus here on, on kind of just recovering from this crisis. And how much of those do you think really started, I mean, what Hurricane Maria is doing is really exacerbating an issue that Puerto Ricans lived for a long time. I mean, the, the debt crisis there. A lot of them already left. What, yes. And already mm -hmm. left? Or yeah. maybe the thought yeah. process was started about debt. that big move. 
you know, this underscores the relationship between Florida and the Caribbean, right? Including Puerto Rico. This, we are tied at the hip, economically, trade, by heritage as well. So even the Virgin Islander community is significant here in Florida as well. There are a number of ambulatory patients right now at FIU, um, folks with diabetes and other, other illnesses Dialysis as well. Dialysis folks. Dialysis yeah. folks. Um, but it's really underscores the connection that we better be ready to welcome these folks, because they're U.S. citizens, by the way. You know, that, that brings up there are the, the official death count um, on, in Puerto Rico is 16 to 19 people without having any access to some of the outlying hospitals where, that are being used as morgues, without considering that people who might need something like dialysis and go without it for weeks on end might add to that. I mean, it is a horrific situation. The governor was asked about that at a press conference this morning, the governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosselló, and he said, you know, that the number, he and his staff said, we're keeping the number there because we don't know exactly how many deaths are attributable to the storm, and we are trying to confirm it. But we have published a report from the Puerto Rico Center for Investigative Reporting that this is likely a massive undercount, because we just don't yeah. know. And then, and then you have the residual of after the hurricane of what happens you know, with all the, um, exactly. the recovery efforts from that, because yeah. that's connected as well. No, I, I agree with Patty. I think it's, it's a, a huge undercount. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not there. She could definitely speak more. But Let's I hope totally, not. Oh, but of course. Absolutely, but of course. it's definitely going to be a lot more. I mean, yeah. it's tragic. Uh, let, let's talk uh, just for a minute, if we can, about Governor Rick Scott. I mean, to his credit, he has been to Puerto Rico. He has offered aid. Um, some people say, okay, though you've talked a good game, but step up, do something. Has he, has he done enough? He certainly talked enough. He uh, is sending some Florida Department of Law Enforcement officers to help with law enforcement in Puerto Rico. Yeah, he has like offered... Like 1,500, I yes, believe. Yes, quite a few agents. Um, and he has offered to help. You know, there's the, some of the bureaucracy here is that you can't overstep your boundaries as a governor and just impose what you would like to do to help another, right. another state, or in this case a territory. They have to ask you for your help. And well, I think Rick Scott is aware that if he runs for the U.S. Senate next year, as expected, mm -hmm. The Puerto Ricans in Florida who will be voting in that race will remember uh, what he does or doesn't do in this case. So he's kind of walking this line of offering aid, but he can't just take it unless the governor of Puerto Rico wants it. And so right. uh, he's being proactive. He's he's staying involved, and we'll see how it plays the best out. Thing, the best as thing he should could... be, as he should be proactive, because going back to the point that we were talking about, the influx of Puerto Ricans, <laughs> uh, the Florida is the one that's going to be more more affected. So the fact right. that he's being proactive, whether it's political or not. Yeah. I in mean, a I And well, let's, let's point out the and obvious, totally which agree. is yeah. most Puerto Ricans in this point. country vote Democratic. Right. Of course, <clears throat> he understands the optics of that. But the best thing that he could do, Michael, is really make a phone call to the minister in New Jersey and tell his well, political Well, they had, well, they had, lunch, a good they had lunch on with Friday. The I mean, the, what better time to say, here's what I saw, here's what I advise you to do, but they're discreet, we won't know. Before we run out of time here, uh, Patty, you were in federal court in Miami this week, late this week, I believe, on uh, Wednesday or Thursday. When Friday. Friday. Friday when former, Renee was there too, yeah. And Renee, you were there too? All right. Before Judge Robert Scola, a really excellent judge, and uh, former state representative Eric Fressen, who didn't pay federal income tax for nine years, was a big player in the legislature, got sentenced. Uh, tell us about that. He pleaded guilty to not filing a federal income tax return in 2011, but he did not file them for nine years. Now, he was making money from three different employers, two of them which were withholding taxes and paying those to the federal government, one his own company, which was not. And he was hoping for a year of probation, first time offender, misdemeanor, but uh, the prosecutors were asking six months prison, six months house, arre house arrest, and the judge sentenced him to 60 days in jail over an intermittent 15 day period over four months, saying, we can't let this happen when you're a public servant. And these, uh, out of those nine years, are the eight years you were in the state house, or you were the chief of the budget committee uh, for the education, uh, right. for education, yeah, he the was, education he budget. Was a, he was an example. I, they yeah. said we can't just let this go by. Yeah. Listen. How the mighty have fallen. We we are out of time, Renee. So <laughs> next, time, <laughs> next time you'll get that last word. But for <laughs> now, no, no, I didn't want the last word. I just wanted to add to. He's got that on tape. Time. That that's a problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Great thank round you. table. Thank you. Up next, thank you. Building the wall is taking the stage and coming up. It's Pulitzer and Tony Award-winning playwright is with us live.
As they used to say on Monty Python, now for something completely different and something I can tell you very, very good. It's a play called Building the Wall. It's running right now at the Arsh Center in Miami. It's as relevant as the headlines in today's newspapers, but it was actually written before last year's presidential election. What is a wall? It's a, it's a, a device. It's a barrier to keep people from getting in. What we built is so much more effective. The man who wrote those words is playwright Robert Schenken. His works include All the Way, about the LBJ after the Kennedy assassination, and the screenplay for Oscar-nominated Hacksaw Ridge. And fresh from, uh, what, the overnight flight from Europe? <laughs> Good morning. Right from Vienna, yes. And right. to Great South, to have uh, you. South Miami. Thank you. It's, Thank very, you. it's very nice to be here. You're, we're glad you are here, Robert. I saw the play on Thursday night, and a friend asked me to describe it, and I said in one word, harrowing. I mean, mm. and powerful. I think that was me. You yeah, told I that to me. Yeah, I think you are the friend. <laughs> yes, I think you are. So uh, sort of set the scene here. It's a two-person play. It's set in the future. And it is in an America uh, after Donald Trump is elected. But in fact, you wrote this play before the election. I, yes, I wrote it in October, actually. It, uh, and although I thought the election, like a lot of people, would turn out a little differently than it did, even at that moment, I felt that um, we had crossed a line in this country. That, o that October, damaging, uh, in October. O October was well into the year of a crazy campaign a crazy season. crazy presidential election. What, what was... What were you feeling at that time? What were you trying to get out? What made that happen? You know, what it was for me, and, and I think for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of your audience, is that um, it wasn't simply the incendiary kind of race-baiting rhetoric that we were hearing from the then Republican candidate. It was the way in which intelligent and otherwise well-informed individuals, uh, journalists, politicians, were trying to explain this away and mitigate it. It was, it was normalizing the abnormal. Mm -hmm. And that's where democracies go wrong when and that happens. Is that, the, is that the doorway to totalitarianism, Absolutely. to fascism? That's right. It's when, it's when citizens, ordinary citizens, were hearing this kind of thing and, and, and getting worried or being told Don't, not, to, not to worry, it's just words, it's just rhetoric, just campaign words. And as we've seen, it wasn't. It isn't. You know, fact. that that kind of comment will, I think, make people think of Nazi Germany and the very beginnings of Nazi Germany where good German citizens who were not part of the Nazi party really just kind of went along with things. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the totalitarian playbook. It's very well established. And one needn't go as far back as 1934 uh, yeah. as far as that goes. But, uh, you know, it's about... Uh, uh, dissing the news, uh, journalism. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, pressuring the judiciary system. Uh, it's uh, and and above all, of course, it's about demonizing the other. Yeah. Uh, in but, this case, uh, immigration. Yeah, uh, Robert. I've got to say, I mean, this is a two-character play, and the actors are Karen Stevens and Greg Weiner, two I think outstanding actors. This is a production done by City Theater. This is obviously Greg in a prison uniform. Uh, and uh, Karen is a professor who comes to interview him in prison. And uh, he begins to tell the story of why he is there. Uh, and it is just scalding uh, as it goes further. Uh, but you know, you present in his character, a uh, a man who wanted to do the right thing and clearly did not. Yeah. Yes. No. I think uh, you know what we're looking at here is the slippery slope. Uh, the the how easy it is for all of us, um, good people, people of conscience, to make this compromise and then this compromise and and this choice because it seems like the right thing or the only thing to do. And, and how if we don't hold on to our, to our morality, to our conscience, how easy it is yeah. to, to wind up in a very dark place uh, as an individual and as a country. The, uh, the production at the R Center, the, I don't know if it was opening night or one of the opening nights, you had an after dialogue. What was that like? Um, it's, I have to say, I have my hats off to City Theater. They've done a splendid job of curating this. So on almost every performance, there is a talkback 
uh, afterwards with the really in, uh, important, significant uh, individuals within the South Florida community on a lot of these issues. And what I found last night uh, at uh, the R Center and at every production I've now been at across the country and in Europe is that people are so um, provoked by this theatrical mm -hmm. experience, they want to talk about it. They want to share their thoughts. They want to ask questions. They want to engage on these issues. Yeah. And City yeah. Theater has a series of facilitators who are superb. Top well, notch. Well, we want to say that this is at the Arts Center in Miami, 730. It's in a beautiful little kind of black box theater. And it runs through October 8th, which I believe is next Sunday. So yeah. if you are interested in really provocative, well done theater, I recommend it. Thank you. It's a, it's a great production. So uh, great to have you here. Thank Thanks. you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Robert. Thanks. All right, up next, the definition of leadership this week. And this one had nothing to do with storm rescue. Stay tuned. And this right there, a live look from our Mount Sinai Medical Center cam. And here is weather authority meteorolog meteorologist Jennifer Correa with our <laughs> Sunday forecast. Help me, Jen. I, I'll help you, Mike Owen. Glenna, good afternoon. Well, temperatures are warming up fast, certainly with uh, the sunshine we're getting out there. 90 degrees already in Miami. We should stay just at that for the rest of the afternoon. Winds picking up speed. That's the big story, weather story-wise. Uh, the next couple of days, winds will be topping 20 miles per hour, even gusting up to 30 by Wednesday. Now, right now, wind speeds are around 15 miles per hour along that easterly breeze. We have showers rolling on shore. It is raining heavily from Pompano Beach up to Deerfield Beach and more rain is expected, but all in the form of a tropical wave that right now is moving over the island of Hispaniola. That tropical wave is headed our way Wednesday into Thursday. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Keep that rain chance at 30%, 40% as we start off the new work week. Then by Wednesday, grab the rain gear, not the umbrellas because they'll be breezy. Grab the raincoats and the rain boots by then we'll be dealing with soaking showers throughout the rest of the work week. Great. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> this week there was a lot of focus on leadership and lack thereof. Most storm related. We talked about a lot of that today. Crowded out of those headlines was a moment that defined leadership. An Air Force Lieutenant General who is superintendent of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He rounded up 4,000 cadets and 1,500 staff members, and he delivered a singularly clear message. If you can't treat someone with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you can't teach someone from another gender, whether that's a man or a woman, with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you demean someone in any way, then you need to get out. And if you can't treat someone from another race or a different color skin with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. That was the swift, direct, undiluted response delivered this week after five African-American cadet candidates found racist scrawlings on their dorm door boards. No discussion, no debate about how to handle it, and no keeping an ugly incident under wraps to protect the school's image. Lieutenant General Silveria took the lead, and he drew the line. He set the tone and the moral compass. At this moment, we have yet to hear whether the Air Force has tracked down the culprits. In the context of recent events like those in Charlottesville and debates over issues like the NFL player protests, this country is hungry for a leader who both demands and models dignity and respect. Lieutenant General Silveria showed what that looks like at a time when we should have many more examples of that. So what do you think? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Do it via email or Facebook or Twitter or any way you like. Here are the addresses. We are very easy to find. We love hearing from you and you will hear back from us. Remember, stay informed, get involved and have a great Sunday.